Hello, welcome to this Joseph Browntree Foundation webinar. It's the third in their in-depth economic discussion series on a recovery that reduces poverty. I'm Vicky Spratt and I'm your chair. I'm also the housing correspondent at the iPaper. Today, we're here to talk about social housing, specifically how investing in it can boost economic recovery, improve housing affordability and security for those on low incomes. This is in my view, and all of the reporting that I do, a crucial question. As the public health crisis caused by COVID-19 has brought the housing crisis into sharp focus, it has also brought a renewed focus onto housing and homes. The status quo, unstable and unaffordable rents in the private rented sector, a social housing shortage, was unacceptable before this pandemic. Now it is unworkable for our country. Heading into the pandemic, 14.5 million people in the UK were in poverty after their housing costs. Around 4 million households were in housing need due to homelessness or because they were living in unaffordable, indecent or overcrowded accommodation. So we must consider this. That's why today we will focus on how building social housing now could stimulate our economy, unlock people from poverty and end homelessness. I am joined by three brilliant panellists who are all going to say something about this. Rachel Earwalker, sorry, <laughs> I always do get, uh, get Rachel's name wrong and she's going to absolutely kill me. Rachel Erica, a Joseph Roundtree Foundation economist who has my eternal apology for getting it wrong. Ian Mulhern, former director of consulting at Oxford Economics and director of the Social Market Foundation, and Yolanda Barnes, chair of the Bartlett Real Estate Institute. Before we begin, some housekeeping. All of your microphones, if you are an attendee, will be muted throughout this webinar. We will first hear from the panelists, and then we will move to a Q&A, but you will be able to ask questions throughout. We will just get to them later. Because we have a huge number of attendees today, which is great, we may not be able to answer all of your questions. If we can't, this is being recorded, it will be online and you will be able to, to view it at a later date. Firstly, let's hear from Rachel, who is going to talk about the Joseph Browntree Foundation's new report. Thanks so much, Vicky, and you are absolutely forgiven. The name's a tricky one. I think, uh, you know, like 0.1% of people get it, so we are fine. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, Great, is that coming up with the right PowerPoint for everyone? Perfect. So before COVID hit, uh, four million households in England were in housing need. Oh, classic saga. Sorry, everyone. I'll bring it back. Is it showing the slide saying, uh, setting the scene? Great. Cool. I will now set the scene. So before COVID hit, we had four million households in England who were in housing need due to homelessness or because they were living in unaffordable, indecent or overcrowded accommodation. The private rental sector has doubled over the previous two decades and private renters in poverty face the highest costs of any tenure, yet the sector has struggled to adapt to the changing needs of tenants, currently offering little security and stability for households at the same time as we've faced a serious shortfall of social housing. COVID has exacerbated these concerns. Our JRF polling in May showed that almost a quarter of renters were worried about meeting their housing costs in lockdown. For families with children, this was higher again at 31%. And it's particularly worrying when we know that almost two thirds of renters have no savings. COVID is also unlikely to leave the housing market unscathed. It has exacerbated concerns about supply and how the housing sector will be able to continue to build our much needed homes. The government has of course introduced some welcome measures as we've gone through COVID to help ensure that there's support for people to meet their housing costs while we're in lockdown. So they took quick action to work with lenders and announce a mortgage holiday for homeowners to increase the local housing allowance rate to reflect the bottom 30% of local rents again, to halt evictions, 
and to quickly house rust sleepers through the Everyone In scheme. And while these actions are welcome, unfortunately, they're also temporary and they fail to solve the larger problems in our housing market. We're currently facing a serious shortfall in the amount of sub-market housing or social housing being built every year. So as this graph shows, we're falling far short of meeting the demand for social housing, and in particular for social rent, which is shown on the very left-hand bar of the graph. Um, the number of homes that we were here, um, sorry, the number of homes that I'm showing here are based on an independent uh, analysis by Glenn Bramley, and he calculates that 145 social homes per year are needed to meet demand. These are made up of 90,000 for social rent, 25,000 for affordable or intermediate rents, and 30,000 for shared ownership. However, last year, we only built 7% of the social rented homes that we need. Why? Total spend on social housing has been too low and focused away from affordable rent. There are local delivery barriers, including viability, land use and shortage, planning constraints, skill shortages, and competition for existing resources within local authorities' funds. And other policies have played a role too, including the recently removed cap on councils borrowing through housing revenue accounts, but also the policies around right to buy. And as well as these barriers, the net gains and losses of social rent homes are really, really stark. So in 2018-19, sales, demolitions, and conversions from social rented homes to other types of housing came to almost 24,000. In the same year, we only built just over 6,000 social rent homes. So what have we been building since the last financial crisis? Well, we've been building for home ownership and we've been increasing the aggregate level of housing. So this graph here shows the number of completed homes by the private sector, by the purple line, and the public sector, so local authorities and housing associations in the light blue. As you can see, the number of homes brought on through the private sector grew significantly from 2013, while public sector housing stayed relatively more constant. And 2013 is significant, and it shows a turning point for private sector building. And a big part of that is because in 2013, the Help to Buy Equity Loan Scheme was introduced. And it had the intention of addressing the mortgage slump that followed the GFC and was to play a role in stimulating the economy. And it largely did so. So it supported the delivery of just over 263,000 properties up until the end of last year, costing around 15 billion pounds. So the purple dotted line that I've just added in there shows the number of homes that were delivered in the private sector without help to buy. So it therefore shows how many homes, how homes purchased using help to buy made up a significant proportion of those new private homes. Now, of course, sorry if you can hear the siren, live on a very busy road. Um, but of course, just because help to buy made up a, a large proportion of new homes in the private sector over those past six years, it doesn't mean that without it, there would have been 263,000 fewer homes over that period. Some of that capacity would have, of course, created other homes. However, because the intervention in the housing market following the financial crisis was primarily targeted at home ownership and government support for other 10 years remained low, House building has remained skewed towards increasing the number of homeowners. The dotted blue line that I've just added here is a stylized example of what that same commitment could have done for publicly delivered housing. The same number of help to buy homes had been delivered by the public sector on top of levels built, we'd be far closer to achieving the 145,000 social homes that we need per year. Um, and because of the lack of investment in a better balance of tenures across the distribution, and in particular for housing that fits the needs of those on low to middle incomes, affordability for renters hasn't improved over the same time period. And it's not just affordability that hasn't been addressed as a result of the lack of investment. Overcrowding, decency of homes, and the security of tenure are all issues that have unfortunately been escalated over the last 10 years. So what does it mean? It's time to invest now. We know that housing is an excellent form of economic stimulus, 
but it can also be more effective and have far better outcomes if we invest in a better balance of housing tenures than we've done following the previous financial crisis. In general, housing is a great form of stimulus for three main reasons. Firstly, the lag between investment and impact is often far shorter in housing than in other types of investment. And so it answers the government's call for shovel-ready investments, particularly when recent work published by the LGA shows us that more than a million homes with planning permissions haven't been built yet. Secondly, investment in housing creates jobs through direct effects in the construction sector and indirectly through the supply chain. The construction sector has an FTE multiplier of almost two, meaning that for each job created, another two will also be created. And it's significant for investment in the sector in the downturn, and it's particularly important with one and a half million construction workers currently reliant on furlough schemes. It can therefore also reduce our expenditure on universal credit in the short term for those in the construction sector who aren't currently in work. And then the third box here in the purple is that housing investment can create significant tax revenues through taxes, including council tax, corporation tax, income tax, and national insurance contributions. So this plus the reduced benefit expenditure can have a really positive impact on government borrowing. Moving on to the pink box here on the slide, investment in social housing is also offset through reducing the housing benefit bill. So our modeling, which we've done for this paper, which specifically focuses on savings to housing benefit, shows us that if the government were to commit to building 90,000 homes a year for social rent and 25,000 homes a year for affordable rent, over five years through the Affordable Homes Program, the savings on ben housing benefits over 30 years would total 35 billion pounds in today's prices. Finally, investment in tenures that households can actually afford that provide security and stability and are decent homes will absolutely improve the living standards for hundreds of thousands of households and help to lift out more people out of poverty. So given all of this, how do we make it happen? So the most direct route for the government to ensure the supply of social housing is through grant funding. It's absolutely welcome that the Chancellor committed to extend the Affordable Homes Programme from next year. However, the current plan isn't sufficient to address need. Our analysis shows that the Affordable Homes Programme is set at a level which would only be able to deliver around 75,000 homes for social rent over five years which is around 375,000 short of the number that we need over that period. And unfortunately, the current planning reform proposals show little ambition to deliver more affordable housing beyond the current levels. So we're, recommend, we, we're recommending investing an average of 18 billion pounds per year or 90 billion over the five year period into the Affordable Homes Programme for at least the next five years to invest in a better balance of tenures within the government's target of 300,000 homes per year. But in addition, we also need to invest in our local authorities to help to deliver this program. Firstly, reforming right to buy so that it works to support house building by allowing local authorities to retain their receipts from sales, use right to buy receipts to help cover their scheme costs, and also to top up inadequate receipts with other forms of funding. Secondly, we want to ensure that Section 106 or its replacement through planning reform still delivers for communities and local authorities are supported to manage the viability of building social housing in a downturn, which is particularly important given the current reliance on the cross subsidy model. We also recommend that the government pause attempts to roll out the first homes policy until economic conditions recover. We cover this off in another briefing we publish if you're interested in reading up on that. And then thirdly, we must provide support for local authority skills to help deliver this program. Investing in staffing to unlock the development of social housing will also be a cost effective way to boost local economies. I think just lastly, the, current, the government here currently has a golden opportunity to address both issues of economic downturn and our affordability and insecurity crises by investing in social housing. For every home that's built, a household can be lifted out of homelessness or housing need. We can create more jobs and more money can be injected into our local economies.
So that's our view uh, on why social housing is much needed right now as we go through the economic recovery. And I'm really looking forward to everyone's questions and also hearing from the rest of our panel. Thank you. Rachel, thank you so much. And now we're going to hear from Ian. Thanks, Vicky, and thanks, Rachel. Um, thanks also for, for putting together such a great report um, to you and Darren. It's, it's a, you've really done the hard yards, I think, on thinking about how we would uh, fund the social housing expansion and, and also dealing with the skills side of it and the capacity limitations that are often ignored as well. So it's, it's, it's also a really timely report, I think, um, given the obviously the, the, the planning white paper is out and the, and the proposals to uh, end uh, Section 106. As a, as a route to funding social housing. So uh, a really important uh, report. Uh, and there's obviously been in the discussion following on from the planning white paper, there's been a huge amount of focus on the specific mechanism of section 106 and, and the challenges that, that, that it will pose uh, it, it, by, well, it's being withdrawn and will pose. Uh, and I want to argue that really we should think more and perhaps be more interested than we uh, perhaps have been uh, in the debate uh, in the intellectual foundations of the white paper, because I think it's here that we need a bit of a rethink if we're really to tackle the crisis of housing affordability. So I sort of want to take a step back. And in a nutshell, I think the real reason or one of the major reasons why advocates of more social housing have been fighting really a losing battle for more than a generation now is because the intellectual climate has been fundamentally inhospitable to the concept and i think that climate has been uh, wrong so i want to sort of set out uh, why um uh, and i think at the heart of it is the question of what is what what's the nature of the, the housing crisis um now, when, usually when some people in society don't have the basics in life, we generally think of that as a problem of uh, a dis distribution. Uh, some people not having enough and others having, uh, having, having plenty. Uh, for example, even in a time of record employment levels just before the COVID-19 crisis struck, um, most people who were concerned about food banks wouldn't have argued that a little bit faster GDP growth would have solved the problem and made sure that everybody had enough food on the table. We'd recognise that as a problem of distribution, that some people simply don't have the resources they need to tackle uh, poverty. Uh, so it's not a problem of the aggregate amount of economic activity going on or the aggregate amount of income. It's about the distribution of that. But housing is one such basic uh, uh, good uh, and essential of life for which the distributional perspective has been obscured for several decades now really by the dominant paradigm that the real problem is that we haven't built enough houses uh, in the market and uh, on this view uh, obviously it'd be very familiar to to you all uh, rising the rising price of houses and spiraling rents are all part of the same story there are the result of inadequate supply of market sector housing in aggregate um, and of course we've seen prices jump from uh, something around a norm of four times median income uh, in the uh, second half of the 20th century to uh, what's now around eight times median income, uh, which encapsulates the unaffordability of buying houses. Uh, and also we've uh, obviously seen spiralling uh, average rents. And the unavoidable conclusion from this uh, view of the world is that we just need to build more. Uh, and if a lack of supply was the cause, then obviously boosting supply in general, market supply, social housing, whatever, would reduce prices and rents and solve the problem. Um, and, and this begs a question, though, which is what, why wouldn't the market just respond to these higher prices? And so the conclusion comes that it must be a government failure, not a market failure. It must be that excessive regulation is getting in the way of uh, the clear incentives provided by high prices. So therefore liberalizing planning is the obvious solution to this, uh, to this challenge. And, and what goes with that is, an, is a, a, a sort of uh, a, an associated understanding that there's no real need for tinkering with distributional measures like social housing or housing benefits, because these are seen as sort of sticking plasters, as sort of second best solutions. And that's why for me, it's, it's difficult for proponents of redistribution measures like proponents of uh, the importance of social housing or housing benefits to argue that case while also accepting the diagnosis that the real problem is a, a, a lack of supply 
uh, in aggregate. Uh, so that's the kind of dominant narrative, but there are, there are in my view, there are some serious uh, problems with, with that account. Uh, it, it hangs together superficially, but when we start to look at the, the numbers underneath uh, of what's going on in the housing market, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I don't think the story uh, holds up. So first, um, uh, there are so there are there are five real real issues I want to highlight. One is that um, uh, if there is uh, inadequate supply, if there's been inadequate supply of market housing, that should affect market rents. Most e economists would recognise that you know you, you measure the the underlying uh, uh, um, price of housing services as it's called as it's known uh, by looking at what's happening to market rents. But ONS data show that. Uh, those rents um, have risen significantly slower uh, than household incomes for the last 15 years at least since data began and on my analysis since, since at least uh, the late 1990s. And this is really unsurprising since we know that the number of houses, the number of housing units has been growing faster than the number of households each year since at least the mid 90s again and, and probably significantly earlier. Uh, so market rents have been uh, pretty benign. The thing that's driven rising average rents, as you say in the report, um, is the relative shrinking of the social housing sector. So the people have shifted out of the lower rent tenure into the higher rent tenure, which has pushed up the average uh, rent, even though uh, the market rents have not particularly uh, uh, um, increased uh, relative to incomes. The second issue is that research by me and, and others has shown that um, the spiraling price of houses is exactly what you would expect it to see in a world of falling interest rates and falling mortgage rates, which has been the case pretty relentlessly for the last 20 or 25 uh, years. So even with supply exceeding the rate of household formation and bearing down on rents in, in um, relative to earnings or incomes, um, falling interest rates essentially push up, drive a wedge between prices and rents because the house, a house price, has, a house's price can be broadly thought of as equal to the discounted value of the stream of rent that you could get for it. So if interest rates fall, then inevitably prices rise, even if rents are unchanged. The third uh, issue with the consensus view is that um, even as the government's own internal models show, uh, the impact of supply, while it would uh, cut prices and rents, it wouldn't do so by very much. Um, and it, typically we find that 1% you know, more housing would could cut prices or rents by about 1.5% to 2%. Uh, um, but what that really translates into is that no plausible amount of supply could get price to income ratios anywhere close to where they were back in the year 2000. Uh, we might at best get perhaps 10% off rents or prices after about 20 years if we build 300,000 houses a year for the next uh, 20 years. But with some people paying you know, 50% plus of their income in rents, this to me doesn't sound like a solution, even for the next generation. It's an improvement, but it's not a solution. Fourth, it's, it's actually pretty hard to stack up the claim that the planning system is, um, is to blame for this. Um, permissions, if you just look at the headline numbers, permissions granted have exceeded 350,000 a year in England for each of the past three years. And net additions have been running at uh, just 200, around 230,000 for those three years. And that surplus of permissions each year has been, has been uh, uh, persisted for many years, even through the downturn after the last financial crisis. So it's not, it's, it's not easy to uh, blame the planning system for this uh, supply problem, even if you do think that needs to be solved. And finally, it's not all that straightforward uh, that um, housing supply should be expected to respond to prices anyway. This is not like the market for baked beans. Land is, a, uh, uh, land is the thing that's rising in price. And so when you're a developer, developing it and selling it is a one-shot game. You only get to do it once. So when you choose to develop and sell, depends not on what you think the price is today, but really what you expect the price to be tomorrow. And if you think prices are going to go higher or be just as high tomorrow, then there's no particular reason to, to, to build out today. Um, so there's not a simple relationship between prices and supply anyway. So all these things mean that in practice, two trends have, have been at work. Uh, one is a collapsing global interest rates has driven a wedge between prices and rents. And the second, that while uh, rents uh, have not become, market rents have not become much more unaffordable, 
the lack of social housing and, and the cuts to housing benefits have left low income people increasingly exposed to those market rents, which were, have always been pretty unaffordable. Now, planning doesn't seem to be much of a barrier, and even if it is removed, it wouldn't create much, make much of a difference. So that tells us this isn't a problem of supply in aggregate and the dominant story of that uh, uh, being, the, being therefore the solution, but it's one about distribution and, uh, and making housing available at affordable prices for low-income households. So what are the solutions, what are the levers that we've got to tackle this? Well, there's essentially three. The first is that you can regulate market rent levels, uh, as we used to do uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and uh, you could uh, put caps on, on, um, uh, on market rent levels. The second is you could subsidise private renters through things like housing benefit. And the third is you can build social housing. Now, the first of those I don't think is a, uh, is a, is a tried and tested, but uh, an um, unsuccessful, in my view, experiment. Um, it's certainly the case that before the 1980s, before deregulation, renters paid much lower rents, and that was primarily owing to, to the regulation of rent levels. Um, but the results were arbitrary, the housing stock was dilapidated, and it's not necessarily a system I would advocate returning to. So in my view, we need a combination of uh, the second and third levers. Um, and, and how should we think about those? Well, in a sense, offering sub-market market housing provision in the, in the form of social housing is in some ways comparable to, to subsidizing people directly to rent in the private sector, but they both have pros and cons. Obviously, for the hugely increased number of families with children in the, in the private rented sector, they really put a huge premium on stability, the stability of tenure, and that is really important. And I think we have uh, very high numbers of, of families that need uh, need that stability and that really is a critical role paid in the past played by social housing uh, but there's still a role also I think for uh, subsidizing private renters and the flexibility uh, that creates now, unfortunately on the housing benefits side we've we've um, seen you know across the political spectrum it's been sort of a benefit that's been demonized a bit as a sort of subsidy to landlords but over the past 10 years I think we've found out that um, really when you cut housing benefit it's not landlords that, that, that cut their rents it's it's families that end up absorbing the costs of that so we need to we need to I think advocate for uh, the importance of uh, um, a, a much increased supply of social housing but also recognize the importance of uh, housing benefits and its um, validity is an important um, uh, way to tackle the housing affordability uh, problem. So to win the argument for social housing or housing benefit, I think we need to think about the housing crisis in the right way and shed the mistaken belief that this is a problem of aggregates, uh, and focus instead on that problem of distribution. Um, for too long, advocates for the need for redistribution, redistribution measures have gone along with the supply story almost as an asterisk. They've said more supply, yes, but let's make it social housing. But instead, we need to reset the entire way we think and talk about housing, I think, if we're to make real headway in tackling the affordability crisis. Thanks. Thanks Ian, that was fascinating. Just a reminder to our attendees, please do put your questions in the Q&A function. You may have noticed that chat is disabled, so we've had a great question so far, but please do pop them in the Q&A function. And now to Yolanda. Thank you very much and thank you Ian for a great segue in, in, into uh, what, what I want to say, which uh, was really about rethinking the way we do housing. And I think um, there were two... Oh, no. I don't know what I've lost. Oh, uh, hello, sorry, am I back? Uh, did I ever go? Um, sorry, my screen suddenly went crazy. Um, so, I th think, talking about rethinking the way we do housing, two things leapt out at me in, in this report. One was the extraordinarily shocking um, statistic that for over 14 million people are effectively in housing poverty or in poverty after, uh, after housing costs. That's a fifth, fifth of the population. And this is despite the fact that theoretically we have, um, nine, what is it, 19% or so social housing already in place. Um, and I think that in itself sort of raises a whole series of questions which are only exacerbated by COVID because what we know COVID has done is um, potentially, actually for let's say a third of the population, 
boost their economic prospects. There are some uh, industries and sectors that have proved, if you like, anti-fragile. And uh, we know that people, some people, lucky few, are thriving and able to, to, to thrive economically under COVID. Another third who probably never ever considered themselves at risk, for example, people in airline industry, you know, um, earning decent wages and so forth, are potentially devastated. And uh, so what COVID has shown us, if we're talking about, if you like, uh, the distribution uh, of housing and the distribution of, let's call it, good, good economic fortune or, uh, or jobs, um, is that th this is now going to prove extremely fluid. There are going to be, uh, there's a potential for even more inequality as there are winners and losers uh, as we come out, come out of this. And for me, that raises actually a question of, um, the second point of, of the um, study that I was interested in was um, the, the call to sort of rebalance tenures. And straight away, that has me thinking about how we categorize tenure. And I, th I think um, the, the old traditions of social housing, private rented sector, and so forth, are terribly uh, muddled and perhaps fatally so. Because what we've done is conflate who owns land, if you like, the property, uh, with who occupies it, and then on top of that, how it's occupied. Um, so I think it would be far uh, more sensible, first of all, to, to separate out, if you like, the actors, the controllers of land, public sector or, or private sector, perhaps, but separate that then from whether um, it's owned outright uh, by the occupier, mortgaged by the occupier, and then in the rented sector, most importantly, whether it's market rented or subsidized by, in some shape or form. And, the, and uh, um, those two issues, who owns the land and who, um, how it is occupied, are two completely separate issues. And what I would suggest is that, um, that there, was, there were three actors in, in, in this drama. Um, there's the occupier and the needs of the occupier, um, which uh, leads to some extreme tra tragedies and, um, uh, and, and issues. There's uh, then who, uh, if, if you like, the landlord, the, the contr controller or owner, owner of land as, a, as another party. And then the third party, of course, is the state. Um, after all, all land is ultimately owned by the state. The state um, has the capacity to be um, a really major player in this, um, but is consigned to the sidelines, sort of uh, bringing in emergency measures, fiddling uh, w often with uh, deeply unintended consequences, um, whether it's, it's in the sphere of planning or, or social renting or, or, or um, all sorts of other re reforms. And I think um, what COVID has the capacity to do is to bring to the foreground the nature of, uh, uh, if you like, the relationship, the, co the covenant between state, landlord and, and occupier. And um, what has become very apparent to me is that um, the state can and indeed does step in under uh, in extremists, as in COVID, um, the, the the response to um, uh, you know, the homeless situation shows that given enough investment and state intervention, uh, things can change quite dramatically. Whether permanently or not, I I, I doubt, but um, it does show that the state is an important actor, and. Um, I think uh, we have to have to rethink um, if private landlords are going to be called upon uh, to, uh, with this, for example, the no eviction rule, um, actually participate in this, this triangular relationship. Um, that, and equally, if landlords are to benefit from a, this, any kind of safety net, either through rent subsidy or housing benefit, um, that there needs to be a new type of covenant between all three, three parties. And I think um, it's not just about rebalancing tenure, it's therefore about rethinking tenure. Not only how do we take care of the people who are falling very unexpectedly 
um, as, as it were, in, into, into house, housing poverty, uh, in this case as a result of COVID, and how we uh, support them, prevent evictions, enable them to pay their rent. Uh, but in return, um, how do uh, the state and the landlord who, who may bear that actually benefit from people rising out of that poverty and prospering? And I think it's particularly important to align the interests of occupiers, landlords and the state uh, and the interest being uh, that communities thrive, basically, that, that the economic, social and environmental life of a community, um, uh, if, it, if it prospers, um, actually benefits uh, all, all three actors, if you, if you like. And that really does mean rethinking tenure. And um, I think what this paper has the potential to do is to take the narrative away from that very crude uh, supply uh, sort of equation. And I totally agree with Ian. My observation of new housing supply is that at best it, it supplies perhaps 20% of the, of the entire market. It doesn't even truly supply all wealthy owner occupiers. It's a very peculiar and rarefied market out of which we may get crumbs as it were falling on the table of the social housing uh, providers but for, uh, which does very little to provide anything in the middle. Um, in fact I know in London the particular shortfall uh, uh, if, even though there's a, a dearth of social housing the, the, the bigger shortfall is actually in that middle market the sort of sub 450 pounds per square foot mark. So quite clearly, uh, you know, just building, if we carry on building the way we have been, by no means supplies the whole market. And maybe we need to think much more about different segments of the market or the fact that, that there isn't a single market, it's a seri always a series of sub-markets. Um, so uh, what, what I want to do, I suppose, in, in, in this discourse is, is to, as it were, broaden our minds beyond what we've done in the past and how we might use, as it were, 20th century tools to fix the 21st century problem. But I actually think about how we, uh, if you like, frame that problem, how, how COVID maybe has enlightened us as it has accelerated us, you know, 20 years in, in, into the 20, further into the 21st century. Um, and how therefore we might think about uh, taking care of people who are moving out of poverty and um, how we might, without them losing their home or having to change their home, actually flex their tenures and, uh, and create much more fluid tenures. And I suppose I leave uh, uh, this sort of point on, on the note that I think um, digital technology actually has the potential to enable us to do that. The tokenization, the um, uh, distributed ledger sort of technologies actually could enable us uh, to to do that, as it were, electronically, without uh, forcing people to move, to change homes, to downsize, to upsize, or whatever, whatever it is. So I, I think, um, hopefully, uh, you know, I can, I can inject into the discussion some, some really sort of futuristic, imaginative thinking about how we may, might tackle this problem without recourse to that build, 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 homes for heroes type, uh, type standard, standard response. Thank you, Yolanda and Rachel and Ian. We'll now move to the Q&A. Um, we've only got about 20 minutes left, so I'm afraid we won't get to all of your brilliant questions, but we'll do our best. Um, I'd like to kick off with a question. This is for you, Rachel. Um, this is something I get asked a lot. Why don't we just invest in making the private rent sector work, in making it better, in making it functional, in improving the quality? Thanks, Vicky. So, um, so I think it's a great question. I think it's something that we also get asked about a lot as well as, as we do push for more investment into social housing. Um, and I think uh, a couple of things on this. So the, the private rental sector can work really well for people who want flexibility uh, in, in their renting scenario. Um, you know, they're happy to move sort of every few years. They may not have kids. Um, for, so for people like me, the private rental sector works really well. What it doesn't work well for is if, if you need stability and security. So at the moment, particularly with, with Section 21, there's, there's no, yeah, for, for families in particular, it doesn't help you with your security and stability um, in your renting. 
It also isn't well suited to those who have additional needs for their housing. So if they need a house to be more accessible because they have a disability, it, it, it just doesn't work quite well enough for that. It also doesn't work very well for those who are entering into retirement. Um, so particularly with the high cost of uh, private rental sector rents. So for those angles and for those who are highly likely to be on very low incomes for a long period of time, the private rental sector is quite a terrifying place to be. Um, and I think while we can make a lot of changes to private renting, we can certainly make it more stable, you can have more, um, more autonomy as a tenant, you can have better conversations with your landlord, all of that is fine, but it, do, it doesn't solve the issues for, for a lot of those other scenarios. Um, and that's where social housing comes in. And that's why we need to invest more into that space. Great, thank you. Another question, I'm going to put this to all of our panelists. This is from Rose Grayston around the current government rules on grant for social rent and the government's leveling up agenda. She asks, Current, current government rules only allow grant for social rent in so-called areas of high affordability pressure. As a result, only 10 local authorities across the north have been able to bid for capital grant to build social rent homes since 2018. Could the government's levelling up agenda create new needs for social rent in communities in the north and the Midlands? Um. I might just add a quick thought on that one first, if that's okay. So I think this is really interesting where the need for social housing isn't just because of affordability. Um, it can also be because of like, the decency of, of homes and areas. Um, it, and, it, and it can be, like I said before, because of other things like accessibility and aging population in an area and so on. So I think what we need to do is make sure that we're not just treating social housing as a solution to affordability, but it's actually a solution to a wider range of issues as well. Um, and so that's a really key part here of, of how you could have, why we shouldn't just be putting it in areas of high affordability pressure. And the other thing as well is that the government's levelling up agenda and building more social housing can actually go hand in hand. You know, choosing to build more social housing in these areas to, to, to meet those needs um, can be huge for job creation. Um, and, would anyone else like to add anything before we move to our next question? I'll just add to uh, what Rachel said. I mean, I think I think she's absolutely right. That it's, it's important to think of, you know, in terms of affordability, social housing and 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 housing benefit in the private rental sector are to some degree substitutes. You know, they play similar roles, but it's the tenure stability that that is the thing that that social housing provides, and and that's just as important as the affordability side of things. So that's why you need a mix everywhere, and not just to look through the affordability lens. I agree with that. I think it might also be worth adding that um, I think that the, the geography of the housing market and the economy um, has changed and will tra change rapidly as a result of COVID. I think um, we can't underestimate just how much uh, change, arguably uh, trends that were already in play have been accelerated by, by this crisis. And um, I wouldn't pretend to know exactly how it's going to turn out, but I suspect um, there are actually opportunities for um, what, you, what you might have called in the past economic regeneration in uh, places that have been languishing for, for quite quite a, lo a, a long long while. Um, if we just think, for example, about the, tre the trend to work from home, uh, the desire for people perhaps to um, have more outside space and so forth, quite clearly um, that, that trend towards small, small towns um, away from the big CBDs, you know, is, is gathering pace. So I think we've, we've got to um, get out of this kind of post-industrial uh, north-south sort of mentality and start thinking much more about how cities um, and, and economies um, and particular industries will be far more polycentric um, dispersed in, in, in some ways, um, but the opportunities that does um, offer, if we get, the, if you like, the real estate offer um, right uh, as well. I, I suspect um, 
and we can see this with the demise of the high street uh, too many towns have effectively snookered themselves by uh, creating the 20th century sort of shopping center dream and i think we're in danger of doing doing this with the 20th century sort of workplace dream um and the, the, the places and the environments and the communities uh, that will thrive again it's going to be different to those that did it in, in the 20th century in any case so I, I think all this argues for a really fundamental and for want of a better word holistic rethink of what we're what we're addressing here that we've actually got to think about not just housing a particular sector of the population in a particular location, but actually how the dynamics and interrelationships between very many factors are going to work in future. This really does require some new imaginative thinking, I think. Thank you all for those really thoughtful responses. Um, our next question is about land procurement from Alison Wallace on how land can be secured for social housing. She asks, is there a role for land assembly and servicing for combined or regional authorities? Registered providers can't compete with REIT investors, hotels, student housing, and larger developers, even if grant was, was improved. Linking to that question, does the panel think that community-led housing is one of the ways through which one of the ways through which more social housing can be put in place? And if so, how can we really move that program forward? Yolanda, I, I, I feel maybe this is one for you to kick off. Gosh, well, um, Ian said earlier, I think uh, very wisely that, uh, of course, when we talk about house prices, we're actually talking about land prices. And I think this is where we get so confused about the role of the planning system, because on the face of it, it would appear that a grant of a particular planning use class on a piece of land uh, uh, starts to go govern its value. I think what we also forget, though, is that um, <laughs> housing markets are local monopolies and particularly local housing land markets are monopolies. There is therefore an inbuilt, as it were, shortage of land. And if all we do is say this is for residential, we will always end up with a bidding war where the highest bidder um, by uh, uh, most often sort of creating the lowest common denominator, i.e. Um, you know, mon mono, mono sort of cultural uh, realms of, of, of private housing, um, will we'll win, win out and, and bid the most for land. So I think we, you know, the land system is, is another area that we, that we have to rethink if we really want to address this problem. But all these things require an understanding of how things really work and not how they're, they're thought to, to, to work. And I think uh, that, that's, an, that's another uh, session, session on, uh, on, on land markets, probably a day long conference at least to, to sort of get some of the complexities across. But um, unlike a lot of people who've seen this problem and say, well, the answer lies in designating land specifically for social housing and therefore keeping the price down. I don't think that's going to work because landowners have a tendency, uh, as Ian was point, pointing out with ho homeowners as well, simply not to sell if they think in so at some time in the future. Um, they're going to get a higher price. So I think there's a real danger as soon as you start controlling the way that land's um, lands use or trying to impose either rent caps or uh, if you like planning use caps you you simply get a withdrawal of that supply there's a real real risk there um, there are many different routes to go down you could go down the dutch sort of municipal procurement route that's something that um as rare well i suppose since the new towns hasn't hasn't really been tried but somehow i think we've got to be a lot more sophisticated about land use and land values and we've got to recognize as I say, nearly all of these things that I speak at, people do, don't live in housing units, they live in neighborhoods. And until we um, can get a neighborhood use class or zone or whatever you want to call it, that's fundamentally different from those 20th century sort of investment asset class, classes that we used to place things into, I don't think we're gonna get the land equation, begin to get the land equation right. And, um, I think I think we need new innovative and um, uh, novel methods of uh, procuring land, securing it so that everybody in society can be, can participate in that land and and not just the few who are able to afford a, a luxury new build apartment or whatever it is. 
That's great, thank you. Ian, would you like to add anything to that question? Uh, no, I think that pretty much covered it. Uh, I, I think uh, Yolanda knows much more about this than me, so I'll pass on that one. <laughs> Okay. Well, next up is a question from Joseph Shalam. This is something that I often wonder about um, as well, so I'm interested to know what you all think. He asks, the, the reorientation of the housing system as proposed undoubtedly requires long-term political buy-in at the highest level. What do panelists consider the most likely political narrative that will drive a conservative vision for social housing? I mean, this is a huge question, something that we've kind of touched upon already with how um, social housing conversations about housing benefit have become so loaded in recent years and how the climate's become so hostile to them. So we have a conservative government, we will for a while. How do we answer this question? Um, I'll sort of have a first stab. I think if, if we knew the answer to that question, we would be absolutely nailing it. Um, <laughs> but for now, I think there's sort of four key things and a, few, and a few of them are more long term than short term. So I think in the long term, to, to have proper investment in social housing, we actually need to change our thinking um, around debt levels. Um, and we potentially need to be more comfortable with investing um, in particular programs that are going to have enormous long term benefits to society. And we may not see the impact straight away. Um, and I think it's a really interesting conversation. I think similar, Yolanda, to, to land, we could talk about that for an entire day um, around, you know, what should we be doing with our um, fiscal and monetary policy at the moment? Um, but I think, so that's the first one. I think if we're going to have really, really strong investment for the homes that we need, we, we absolutely need to change thinking around debt. I think the second thing is that we need to change people's view about social housing. I think there's enormous stigma attached to the, the two words of social housing um, and you know if, if you ask sort of the average person in the street they're not going to want a social housing block put up next to them or um, so we need to change I think how we're building it how people are thinking about it and also who needs it so you know a lot of the time it, it, it will be people that you know every, everyday households know who are struggling with their rents or who need some something different for their tenure if they're going into retirement and so on it we need to make it more accessible for people to want more social housing once we've got people's buy-in we're going to get better political buy-in um and not really to just like prompt it but we do have a webinar coming up on how we talk about social housing um so watch that space from jrf um and the other two things which i think are more sort of short term for this government is showing how social housing can be a really good solution to making sure that we are ending rough sleeping. Um, so that's a, that's a key priority of the government for this term. And then secondly, how social housing can go hand in hand with leveling up. Yeah, I, yeah. I think this Sorry, ties in with a comment or a question that somebody else made about, um, I think there's a huge problem with the uh, nature and in particular the time scale of political expediency. The uh, first thing uh, Rochelle said is um, it, this is a long-term uh, benefit and the plain fact is that um, it, it, most uh, politicians of any stripe are after quick wins and frankly there are no quick wins in housing. Um, I think uh, I, I, would, I would extend a, a, a proposition that actually if uh, instead of just concentrating, if you like, on the current account, GDP growth in economic terms, uh, nations, and this is kind of globally, actually uh, looked at a balance sheet, a value of what assets they're creating for the nation. I think um, a, a balance sheet approach um, to the built environment and indeed other, other uh, public assets could be highly beneficial because um, by building social housing and saving that, what was it, 30 billion uh, in the housing benefit, you could actually monetize that and put it on a balance sheet. You'd say, well, the value of this housing is 30 billion capitalized over, uh, you know, um, in, in, into uh, the assets. And I think if, if politicians were abs able to say at the end of the term, not only that they'd increase GDP, which arguably is becoming less re relevant in a, in a uh, sort of stable po uh, population growth scenario in any case, that they'd add, but instead that they'd added X billion to the balance sheet 
um, may, maybe that could go some way to uh, getting over this five year term sort of so, sort of issue and um, almost force a, a longer term uh, th thought process. Um, but certainly seeing um, built assets and particularly social housing um, yeah, as, as an asset, I, th I think is, is important. Ian, would you like to add anything? We're running a little bit low on time. Sure, yeah. I mean, the only thing I was going to say is that I don't think there's anything inevitable about the um, Conservative Party's view on, on, on these things. I think, um, I think two, two things are relevant here. One is there's already been a bit of a political realignment in recent years in, in any case, and many more um, what you might have thought of as socially conservative voters who might have previously been on the left and are quite attracted to the Conservatives, the Red Wall and all that sort of story. So the political uh, stars are sort of shifting uh, anyway. I think the other thing is what was interesting is you have this just slightly schizophrenic attitude um, within the party uh, towards this kind of um, also this supply based free market type view of the housing market which is as I've been saying not really where the problem is so I think the other remaining strut is um, it, it, their suspicion of it is a kind of free uh, that the problem is a, is, a, is a supply problem and once that uh, it, it, if we can get across the point that that's not really where the problem is it's a distributional one then I think there's absolutely nothing that says um, that the Conservative Party wouldn't support uh, social housing is a big and important intervention. Thanks. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, Rachel, I'm going to direct this one at you. This is from Catherine Geddes, who has experience of youth homelessness um, and the lack of housing for young people and the reluctance of landlords to take young people on, which is something I see uh, coming up a lot in my reporting. How can we support young people into safe and affordable housing? I think, yeah, it's a brilliant question. I think we can't expect that parents of every young person is going, uh, are able um, to support them into entering the housing market on their own or support them into entering home ownership as well. So I think, and I think this comes, it comes down to a few things. So firstly, affordable housing. So we need to make sure that private rents in particular can be affordable to those entering the job market, you know, coming out of school, hitting it running for the first time. It, particularly in areas like London, you know, housing is so expensive if you are on a low income. You know, we, we have seen over the last 10 years that it hasn't dropped below sort of 35, 36% of people's incomes who are on the, in the lower income quartile. That's massive. And I, and I think we haven't yet found out how to best support people within the private rental sector. So absolutely, that's where social housing can step in, and we know that. But we definitely need to figure out how landlords can work with communities, um, with people, and with government on how they can also best support um, different cohorts of people who are entering the market as well. And I think there hasn't been enough work done on that yet. Great, thank you. I'm afraid we are out of time because we have a hard stop at three. Um, but I just want to thank our brilliant panellists um, for their thoughtful remarks and to Rachel and Darren, who's not here, for their work on this report, which is fascinating, timely, necessary. Um, I think this is such an important conversation. Um, moving forward, we can't just look at what we do in the wake of COVID, but how we indemnify ourselves in the future against future disasters, because this isn't quite as unprecedented as, as people might have you believe. Uh, we have had pandemics before, it's quite likely we'll have them again. So maybe we can think a bit bigger than just the immediate aftermath. Um, this was the third in the Joseph Browntree's uh, Joseph Browntree Foundation series on shaping an, uh, shaping an economic recovery that reduces poverty. There will be another one on September the 8th, and that's going to look at how we stay afloat as unemployment hits, which is another really crucial conversation. Um, I'm so sorry that we didn't get to all of your questions. There were so many brilliant remarks and questions, and I'm sorry we didn't have time for all of them. This was being recorded, and you will be able to access it online very shortly. Thanks so much.